Hi, and welcome to the Kids Yoga Podcast, the place for all things kids yoga. My name is Jessica Mujis, and after teaching kids yoga for over a decade and being immersed in the industry, I created this podcast as a warm and supportive place for parents, teachers, caregivers, and kids yoga professionals to gather. Episodes include conversations with kids yoga teachers, business owners, and authors, child development experts, informational episodes on specific kids yoga topics, yoga adventures for children, and even the voices of children themselves. It is my hope that you can come here each week and gain inspiration and form connection with your fellow kids yoga community. Welcome to the Kids Yoga Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, and welcome back to the Kids Yoga Podcast. My name is Jessica Mujis, and this week I am joined by Abigail Wilbur. Abigail is an educator, public speaker, and coach. Her passion is to empower people by giving them the tools to support them to navigate the challenges of life. One of her life goals is to make mindfulness inclusive, adaptive, and relevant to all ages. Abigail started teaching yoga in 2007 and children's yoga in 2013. She has taught thousands of children in schools and yoga studios. Her teaching includes mat-based yoga, chair-based yoga, and mindfulness classes in the New York City and Denver area. Abigail loves teaching kids life skills that are often overlooked in schools. These skills include how to calm down, how to pay attention, how to problem solve, and how to cultivate a growth mindset. Since 2015, she has led teacher trainings and continuing education programs to train adults to teach yoga and mindfulness to youth, both nationally and internationally. She supports individuals, groups, and organizations through professional development workshops and training classes to promote wellness and self-care. Abigail offers online mindfulness classes and coaching to help alleviate stress and support well-being for teens and adults. She offers one-on-one coaching to people who feel stuck in their life and are ready to take action to align their life's goals with their true self. You can also find Abigail on Insight Timer. She has published two courses, one for teens to discover their different sources of personal power and one for elementary age kids to learn different tools to support bedtime. Abigail, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm so glad Margot, former guest who's been on twice, she put us in touch. um, And there's so much I want to discuss with you, but I always like starting at the beginning. So when did you find yoga? And then when did you start wanting to teach it to children? Yeah. Yeah. And the beginning is, you know, There's always so much to say, right? The beginning of yoga can always be a really exciting time. Um, I first started practicing yoga in 2006. Um, I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, and um, I actually was seeing a therapist and the therapist was like, try mindfulness-based stress reduction and yoga. And I got in and I was like, this is a different way of being. (laughs) Um, So I've been practicing since 2006. I became a teacher for adults in 2007. Um, And so along that time, I'm just teaching adults. And then I'm also a classroom teacher. And so I've always been working with kids in some form. And it was in 2013 where um, I had just moved to New York City and I was nannying for a family and I took them to their karate class and I'm talking to the sensei. I'm like, yeah, I teach yoga. And he's like, would you like to teach kids yoga? And I was like, oh, you can do both. You're like, you can put both passions together. <laughs> um, and so that is really what started me on the path of teaching kids yoga was in a karate dojo, teaching like groups from four and a half to 12 year olds in one, in one group in one space. Wow. So you 
had not done any training. You you had your own yoga practice. You were good with kids. So you just dove in. Yeah. So what did those, so first of all, that age range is also like, that's really hard. So what did those classes look like at the beginning? <laughs> well, like, where did you start? Yeah. I mean, the reality is, so I've been teaching kids since like 2013. And if I'm being honest, like looking back, like they were a hot mess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I, I'm I, sure. Yeah. I've learned so much in these seven years that I would do it different. Um, but there was definitely a lot more games. Um, also, because it was in a karate dojo, um, the senpais were usually there in some form. And so they were like the like if kids didn't want to do yoga, the kids would have an alternative to do karate. So there was like a mix of karate and yoga. And really, it was just a lot of games and and connection and having fun together. Um, but I realized quickly, like, okay, I need some more training. Right? No, that's great. I mean, if it was perfect right away, I'd be like, wow, <laughs> you know, I don't think that's possible. Because it's such a learning curve, even after you've done tons of training, you know, but that's so interesting. I've never heard yoga and um, karate together, but it seems like they would complement each other. That's they, a good place to to teach. Yeah, they really they did in so many ways, with the exception of discipline, mm -hmm. um, because their form of discipline was like if a kid doesn't listen, they need to do thirty push ups, or if one kid doesn't listen, the whole group has to do thirty push ups. And for for yoga, it's like, oh, I see you're having a you know a, a challenge. How can I support you? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. That was the one part where it was like, okay, wait, how are we going to navigate challenging behaviors? Right, right. Totally. That's a whole other discussion too. Um, so then I saw you told me that you you taught large groups of yeah. kids yoga, like 60 plus kids in a class. Yes. Um, so tell me about that. You said, was it young kids as well as, as teenagers? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It was different schools. Um, I was living in Queens, uh, Queens, New York, for those non-New Yorkers, <laughs> and um, I was teaching in a few different schools, and, and every school has their own way of bringing yoga and mindfulness in, into their school, and some is like, let's combine all of our classes together, and some are like, come in and do it in a chair form in the classroom. And and so um, I had one school in Queens that was an elementary school, and they combined the first grades together and the third grades together and the fourth grades together. And my first year, it was around like 50, 55 kids. And my second year, there was 60 first graders in, in one class at one time. And it was so much fun. And like that situation really helped me just become a better teacher, you know? Yes, you were. I mean, that's a that's a massive group. Um, and it becomes more I've I've taught. I remember when I first started teaching also, this was in Queens, by the way, Queens, New York. It was a, a preschool and it was probably like 25 preschoolers. There were teachers as well, but it was in a gym. So it was just it felt immense. And I remember it. It's when you're teaching that much, it, that many kids, it's like more you're performing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you're like, so how did you tell me about the teens then? If you said you yeah. were teaching that many teenagers, what did that look like? Yeah. And that, you know, it was it was the same in the sense of like I had to be the most engaging person in the space. I had to be interesting. I had to keep the interest of both, you know, first graders and also it was a high school of ninth through twelfth. Um, the extra challenge with the teens was one, they didn't have yoga mats. So the first graders, like that we had boundaries. We understood that for everybody to be safe, everyone had to stay on their yoga mats unless I gave them permission to come off. Um, but with the teens, we were on it, like in a gym, on a kind of dirty gym floor. Mm -hmm. um, and in some high schools, there's like five different gym classes going on at once with those oh dividers. And so that was happening in this one school. So it was so noisy. There was like a dance class. So you heard some music and there was basketball. And I had about 60 high schoolers. And like at the end of every one of those classes, I was losing my voice. But but it was the same thing. It was this, you know, being engaging, but also with high school, it's like relevancy. You know, it's like mm -hmm. um, what's in it for them, you know. And so a lot of that was a lot more talking 
to really build relationship and build relevancy um, versus with the first graders. It was a lot more singing and a lot more like dancing and being silly together. Um, but both were just, I mean, I looked forward to both ages so much because it, it, it helped me become a better teacher and really get clear on, you know, what is relevant for a first grader, what is relevant for a high school kid. Um, and then also just how do you build relationship with dif d these different ages? Yes. So for the teens, um, I know when I've taught teens um, that, so my natural age group, like what, what comes naturally is like three, four, five and mm -hmm. like younger kids. So then teens is like, I mean, whole other ball game. So I would find myself almost scared because you're like, oh, you know, because you feel like you're being judged. But then you come to realize over time, like, oh, no, like this isn't about me at all. Um, but so so what are some of like what are some things you learned, like just kind of being thrown into the situation with so many of them? Yeah. Yeah. And first, I just want to say, like, I am the exact opposite of you mm -hmm. because like the two, three, four, like five I can you know I can do but two three fours is like terrifying to me I'm like ah that sounds so draining right <laughs> um, right so I love how everyone like finds their age group that yes. they love yes um but some of the things that really really worked with teens I mean the first one was um I really thought about if if I had yoga in middle school and high school which I would have greatly benefited from I would have been a terrible student and I would have harassed the teacher because yoga is weird. <laughs> like, yes. I mean, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, as a high schooler or a middle schooler. And if you're asking me to do weird things with my body in front of my peers, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get out of that class because it's so uncomfortable. And so I always walked in with that mentality, right? Now, some kids are learning yoga from their parents and they're totally comfortable with it. Um, but so walking in, like the, the thing that I realized was so important to teens was really starting off with building relationship. They want to know who I am. Like, you know, uh, why did I get into yoga? They want to know about me and they really want to understand what yoga can do for them. Um, and so we would have so many conversations around how yoga can support with things like anxiety. You know, kids are so often told to calm down or, you know, settle their emotions, but they're not taught how. And so that relevancy piece, like of these teens being told things no one's teaching them how to do, kids are like, oh, okay, maybe I should try this then. <laughs> Wait, yeah. you're going to teach me how to do it or how to pay attention. Um, how to problem solve. And so a lot of being with teens is is that relevancy piece. And then what I started to learn with teens is the the more of a relationship you have with them, the the more willing they are to let their kid sides shine, mm -hmm. right? Like the more willing they are to play and to be silly and and to really connect with each other in a more silly, heartfelt way than than the way a lot of kids connect when it's in, you know, high school and middle school. Yes. Yes. And I think with teens, it takes time too, right? It's like, you don't expect to walk in and after the first class that everyone's like loving it. And you're probably, I mean, in my experience, you're going to, you're going to think, oh, this, this, I think they might hate this class. And then you suddenly realize, oh my God, they love it. They keep coming back. They, you know, and then you, so I think that, not taking things personally piece is, is huge. It was a re revelation for me for that age. Um, yeah. Yes. I love that. And start with the relationships. Yeah. Um, so I, I also want to hear about, so you work with children with special needs as well. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear about just that work that you've done and, and how you started with that. Yeah. So that's like another long story that, you know, could take forever to explain, but um I actually started just not even teaching yoga to children with a variety of needs, but I, right after college, I started working in a school for children with autism spectrum disorder. And I fell in love with that population, you know, um, and I worked there on and off for almost eight years. Um, and then when I moved to New York City, I was presented the opportunity of working in a middle school with children with a variety of needs from like learning disability to, um, 
um, anxiety to ADD and ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. And I was like, yes, please <laughs> let me have that school. Um, and so I was able to work in that, that one particular school for six years. Um, and really what just, you know, showed up for me so often, you know, is the first thing is we all have needs. I have needs. <laughs> I have anxiety, you know. Um, and what what I would go when I would go into these schools, you know, with like neurotypical schools and schools for children with special needs, um, it was always just walking in without a lot of expectation. Because if I went in thinking like, okay, tree pose is going to help kids with ADD, right? Then I'm going to try to force something that might not be working with any kids anywhere. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I set clear expectations in every class. What is the expectation of how we're going to be together? What is the expectation of how we're going to treat each other? What is the expectation of how, you know, when can we take breaks? What do we do in yoga? Um, but I walked up or walked into classes without the expectation of like what the actual class is going to look like. And that's where like real magic happened. Um, I had one student who um, she would come to me and she would tell me like, you know, yoga is one of my most challenging classes, but I really like being with you. And in one of the classes I taught half moon. And when she came out of half moon, you know, and, and she is diagnosed with ADD, she said to me, she was like, that was the most focused I ever felt in my life. Now, if I had gone into class saying like, okay, we're going to do half moon to help with ADD, like who knows how they would have received it. So everything I teach in, in with any child is really this like, okay, we're going to do this with this like lens of curiosity and see how it feels for us. Now, I've also taught with like much younger kids, like four and five year olds with a variety of needs. And again, it's just meeting them where they are. So some kids have, you know, zero body awareness. So to even do something like a mountain pose would be really hard when you don't know when, where your body is in space. So I would do stuff like where we'd hop our feet together and apart and together and apart and really feel our feet on the floor before we even thought about being in some type of yoga pose. Um, or meeting my kids where they are, like if they know the song Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes, how can we turn that into a movement where like each body part gets to explore in space? You know, so it's like meeting my kids where they are and then offering like another bit of to explore in those moments. I love this so much. This is like, <laughs> you're just speaking my language. Um, and that's why yoga is for everybody. And that's what yoga at its core is union. And that means, and yoga is now, right? That's the ultimate. We all, you know, a lot of us have the, you know, you have that image of poses and even meditation or breathing, but the ultimate yoga is when you come in and you're, you see who's in front of you and without judgment and just are able to see them. So it sounds like um, you have a talent for doing that for variety of age groups, variety of needs, and um, and it sounds like you that just comes that comes naturally to you. And so I, I think that's just so great that you just you're kind of like you're trying to like spread yoga everywhere. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it definitely has taken practice. I definitely have a mindfulness practice to help with presence. And um, but, you know, at the very beginning of becoming a teacher, um, I told myself like two things. And one is that I'm always practicing being a mirror. Right. And so whatever comes up in class, I want to reflect that to my students. I think a lot of times we don't pause and acknowledge our experiences and then how does our experience like inform our life? Um, and then the other thing that I always had the intention of doing, which I think helps teach all ages, um, is just modeling okay being human, which took me a long time to feel okay being human, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but to make mm -hmm. mistakes and to be transparent and to express emotions and, you know, like just showing up and being my like silly, quirky, fun self and, and, and my kids just knowing like that's who I am and there's places I'm working on growing and learning. There's places I've accepted myself. And so I think that like piece of just really being okay with your humanness, whoever you are and showing up with that 
also really adds to any class you're teaching. That's what um, anyone listening who's maybe just starting out with this and is maybe you've seen other people teach. I think it's so great to watch people teach. Um, however, the most important thing is exactly what you're saying to to show up as you. So yeah. in the past, a lot of my mentors, completely different teaching style than me, um, learned so much from them. But it's like, night and day. If you watched our classes, it's like completely different. So kids yoga, it always, it looks different, like no matter where you're teaching, but yes, that piece of like, come in as yourself, especially with those teens, because if you're coming in not authentic, I mean, yeah, They'll they know. It. Yeah. They yeah. It. And then why are they going to want to learn from you if you're fake? Right. Like- right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Okay, so I we we discussed, you know, prior to con, you know connecting on here, that we both have had experiences within the industry, the kids yoga industry, that have been toxic, um, just behind the scenes within the business. And I, you know, I thought about it. I'm like, you know, this isn't unique to kids yoga. I mean, I think there's toxicity probably in every industry. Um, the good thing now is I think people are maybe talking about it more. Um, so, you know, as, as much as you feel comfortable, I was wondering if you can share a bit about your experience with, um, with that toxicity and then what led you to, to decide to just kind of move on and and move forward from that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what you're saying is like how it's rampant everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just kids yoga, not just yoga. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, you know, the first thing to say about that is that a lot of small business owners never went to business school. (laughs) They never learned, you know, how to manage their managers. And so, you know, I don't think, you know, everyone is doing stuff to be harmful, (laughs) but I think some of the things that they do are very harmful because they just, they don't know. Um, and so, you know, when, when, when I first started out, um, I actually had this person that took me under their wing and they were like, I can see you're so capable of being an amazing yoga teacher, kids yoga teacher. And, and so I willingly went, I was like, this person's a really good teacher. They're really nice. Um, and shortly after, um, I was, I was basically told that if you want to do this work, um, you need to jump through hoops. And I was told that, um, you know, basically like, I just got really nervous there when I said that. (laughs) Um, so let me, yeah. So, um, you know, I was told to jump through hoops and, um, basically the message was, was that, um, you know, you are replaceable. Right. And so if you don't show up and if you don't do what we ask you to do and we're asking you to do it as a favor. Right. Like, oops, we forgot that we promised a demo. Can you do it? Right. And so for me, I'm like, they're thinking of me. Oh, my gosh, that's amazing. I won't even ask if there's pay and I'll never get paid, you know, or um hey, we really need you to write some blogs. You know, we need you to send some emails for us. You know, we need you to connect with some of the other contractors and get on the same page of stuff. And we also need you to come to meetings and we're not going to pay for any of this, you know? And, and at the time it felt really exciting. I felt part of a community. I felt like I was doing really good work and I, and I was, you know? Um, but I was so run down, especially living in New York City And my well-being and my wellness didn't matter because the thing is, is I was always afraid of punishment. I saw other teachers that said no to gigs and they were punished. They didn't get jobs. And so for me, it was like, okay, feast or famine. And I love what I'm doing. It makes me so happy. I'm going to just keep doing this stuff. Um, What actually led me to start to pull away was, you know, I just, I started noticing that things weren't really aligning with my values around yoga. Um, And this was with a few different companies. There's like a lot of gossiping. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just, I'm nodding. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. 
And, um, you know, I was hearing gossip about people that I liked, you know, and then I started to find out some of the gossip that was being said about me. And it really hurt. It really hurt, Um, especially because it was like shortly after my dad died. And it was like, oh, Abby's not bouncing as back as fast as she should. Yeah, (laughs) that's that's yeah, that's horrible. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And even now, like talking about it, it's still, it hurts, you know, like these were people, I thought we had a solid relationship. Um, and, and so that's when I first started to pull away. Cause I was like, Oh wait, if other people are going to be talked about, of course I'm going to be talked about too. And, and this is what's being said. Um, and, and, and then from there, anytime anything with money came up, even though, you know, I had been contracting for a while, um, there was never negotiation. It was all whatever they wanted. And it just started to get really messy after a while. And so finally I decided like, I can, I can do this on my own. And and the other thing that really opened up was I had moved to Colorado and, um, I connected with companies here as well. And one of them was just like, asking me for more unpaid meetings and having me go teach classes for free while they took promotional pictures of it, you know? And I was like, okay, red flag, red flag. Um, but I contracted with another one and it was straight independent contact or contract work. It was like, just you go in, you do your job, you leave. And that's it. Like, and I was like, oh, this is what it means to be an ind- independent contractor in the yoga world. It was like the first aha moment in in what's possible for contractors. Mm-hmm. Wow, yeah, I so much of your story uh, resonates, especially when you said um, that you were given the message that you were replaceable, mm-hmm. because when you said that, I I had never um, been able to articulate um, my experience, and that was exactly what it was. It was you should be grateful that you're getting this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, when you really love the work you're doing and you're going in and teaching children's yoga and the kid, you know, you're seeing your impact, it's confusing because you're like, look at this work that I'm doing and it feels so good to do this. But then to constantly be kind of sent messages that, you're really of no value. And I really, I don't know about you. I really believed it that I was replaced. I really believed I couldn't do it on my own after a while. So, so was that when, when you had, you worked with that company where you're like, oh, I'm actually just being paid for the work I'm doing and that's it. Was that when you started to pull away from like the other uh, work that didn't feel um, as healthy, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, part of it was just moving to Colorado and just having a fresh start and fresh eyes. Um, and then contact, uh, contracting with this one company that was straight contract work. And it was so easy, you know, it really started to make me think about like, things don't have to be this complicated. Um, and also at the same time, like, I was seeing my value and I was seeing my worth and, you know, I am a really good teacher. Like I know that, you know? Um, And, and so it just really started to make me question what am I doing when I'm, you know, having this duality with other companies where sometimes I'm a contractor and sometimes I'm an unpaid intern, you know, even though I didn't sign that agreement, Mm -hmm. that was the message is like, you should be happy for this experience. (laughs) And, and so it really just started making me think like I can do stuff on my own. And I, I started to actually before the pandemic, before Zoom was cool, I started to offer online classes for teens and sometimes for elementary age kids um, through Zoom. And I started to just start focusing on my own business and what I could grow because it just wasn't worth the headache and the heartache and the stress of of trying to jump through hoops for people that didn't appreciate my work at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. I really, I, I think this message is so important. Um, to, to the listeners um, that, yes, you are valuable. Yes, your work is important. And if you're not being compensated for it, 
respected for it, you don't have to you don't have to be there. It could it could feel like you have to because you want to teach, you want to do this. You you can do this. You can do this. Um, there are so many supportive people. Like you said, a lot of small business owners don't have haven't gone to business school. Um which sometimes could be hard, right? It could come out as then they don't know how to manage people and then it could result in this. But it also can be that, listen, you could start a small business. You don't have to go to business school. And for me, I know, you know, in my life, then my husband is, has a business mind, you know, he's he's helping me or you might have a friend or a family member um, who has done this, who can mentor you. So um, I just really appreciate you sharing your story because I think, you know, the the more we talk about this, the more people will feel like, oh, okay, oh, I'm not. I'm, it's not just my experience. There's nothing wrong with me, right? And um, so, I, I guess I was hoping, like, you can offer maybe some tangible things. Like, you said some, you know, red flag. So, are there certain red flags, like, if that you that you notice that maybe if people start to see those, they could say, take a step back and say, hmm, maybe this isn't what I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the first thing to really think about when thinking about red flags is um, what are you going to do about it? Right. Because even if you see a red flag and, and I'm sure this like this relates to any job, this relates to dating, like sometimes we see red flags and we ignore them because we think that the opportunity is 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 greater. Um and so I think the first thing is like to really be clear on when red flags show up in your life, like how do you want to respond? Is the opportunity really that great? And, you know, something something that you said about that that worth and that we have value and if you need to learn, you can get more learning. Um, I just saw this like post the other day on Facebook and because I feel like many people can relate in the wellness world, like people are always asking us for free services. I have parents contact me, parents I've never met. I have no connection to. They found me on the internet and they're like, hey, can you teach a free class for my kids? Or schools I have never contracted with before ever are like, hey, can you offer free professional development for our families and staff? And back in the day, I would have been like, yes, sure, right? And now I'm like, wait a second. Not only have I put in years of money and time practicing and learning my skills, you know, but also I pay like liability insurance, you know, I pay to have a small business. Like there's all of these other things that are worth considering when, when you're in this business that shows that you have value, you deserve to get paid. Um, and so I just want to say, like, when you said that, I was like, like, think of all the time you've already put into your craft and Include that in your rate, you know. Um, but yeah, so red flag. So the first is what do you, what do you do with a red flag? But because for me, I saw red flags and I chose to ignore them because the opportunity felt so great. So the first thing I would just say is um, it's not a red flag, but it's a tip. It's like first of all, know your rights as a worker. What are what are your rights if you're an employee? What are your rights if you're an independent contractor? Um, because I think especially in the yoga world that gets, or in the wellness world, even it gets so blurry. There's no concrete, you know, um, uh, roles for each one. Um, and then I would also say that always having a clear agreement. So like we said, not everyone knows what they're doing in the business world with their small businesses. And they might do these like really short, unclear agreements or contracts when you first start contracting with someone. And, you know, for me at the beginning, like any, any different organization that offered me a contract, I was like, yippee, okay, I'm not even going to read it. Like sign my name here. I, you know, and, um, the problem was that when there's no clear agreements, first of all, who owns my intellectual property? You know, when I create stuff, I didn't know who owned it. So sometimes people took my stuff and claimed it as their own, you know? Um, and so if I go to unpaid meetings, like, is that in my rate, you know, or is that um, something separate that I should get paid for? And so at the very beginning, the, the part where you most want to do the work is the part where you need to really put in the work to have a clear contract that works for you. Um, 
And in hindsight, I should have hired a lawyer, you know, and Mm -hmm. I would have just known my rights right then. And I would have known what to ask for, but I didn't know. And then I just let these unclear agreements go for years without addressing them because I loved the work. Yeah. So I just want to say like, that's huge. And I, I mean, I mean, I could so relate because that same, I was like, oh, excited. I'm not even going to read this. I'm just going to, great. I'm going to be teaching. And um, I think you're so right. Right from the beginning. If you're signing anything, um, read it and, and, and consult. Yeah. Consult someone. If a lawyer that can help you understand it, because I know a lot of times these things are confusing and we're not really sure what we should do be offered. So yes, a hundred percent. Yeah. It's worth the 50 or a hundred bucks for less headache later on. Yes. And usually that information will help you in all of the different organizations you contract with. Yes. Um, but you know, I think the other thing when it comes to red flags is just really how comfortable do you feel with free work, with doing your stuff for free? Um, and because, you know, at the beginning I was like willing to do anything and have 10 hour days and, you know, whatever I could do to help kids ultimately. And I just think that it's really important when you're asked to do free stuff um, to really, you know, ask yourself, what is the message that you're sending to everyone else in this field when, you, when they're doing it for a living and you're doing it for free? Um, because these tools are so needed. Kids need these tools. These are life skills. Like kids are learning stuff they're not learning in school, you know, and, and many of us do loads of trainings. We teach lots of free classes. We do all of this stuff to like really like harness our craft or, you know, hone in on it. And, and, when, when other people come in and they do it for free, what is the message that's going on there? And then how does that actually support the larger community of kids yoga teachers? And so I think that's something to think about is when you're asked to do free stuff, it's really not just about you, but it's really about the whole entire kids yoga community. And how are you supporting or harming that community by doing free gigs? Yes. Yes. Because it's, not, it's not only, so sometimes, okay, sometimes a free, when you first start out, um, for me, like a free job was voluntary. I was volunteering at an organization that I believed in and that work filled me up. I can get chills thinking about it because I loved going. I chose to go there. This was an organization I believed in and that felt good. Mm -hmm. And then that's different from, Um, you know, being asked to do something either for a nominal amount of money that's like barely covering, say, your transportation costs or your prep time or, you know, getting there, the time you're taking to get there and and come back Um, or just teaching for free because you're you just you just want to and it's fine. Okay, I'll do it. But what you're saying is so true. It's not just about you. It's not just about you. It's a you're, you're also, yes, you're sending a message that this work isn't important yeah. ultimately. And it is so, so important. Yeah. It's so, and you know, I was part of that. That's why I yes. feel like I can say it. Like I yes. did so much free stuff without the awareness of the message that I was sending, you know? And so with experience, we learn stuff. Hindsight mm-hmm. is twenty twenty, And, and so for me, you know, the, the other part of it is, is people have asked me for free advice for seven years now, you know, free mentoring, free consulting. And I used to just do it. And I mean, hundreds, hundreds of hours of just free advice, free emails, free, Hey, let's hop on the phone. You know, someone would be like, Hey, I need to talk to my principal. I really want to bring yoga in. And it, it got to a point where, um, One woman uh, reached out to me and she had started teaching yoga um, in one of her kids' schools and she had no uh, kids' yoga training. And she was like, hey, so can I just have some tips on how to teach kids in a school? And I was like, "Um, do you have 15 years of (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, like, and it hit me in that moment. It's like, like you want to do something really wonderful, like teach your kids in schools. But, but if you need that extra support, if you, if you want that also honor other people's time that are doing it. And it was in that moment. I was like, I don't have time for this. We can put something on the schedule. Here's my rate. Let me know. Yes. Yes. Cause it, you know what it is? It's like, um, being able to check in and say, and sometimes we're moving so fast, we don't check in. It's like check in and say, like, how do I feel about this particular ask or like this particular request? Because sometimes it's just like someone you really like and they're asking advice and it's great. It's like you're talking to a friend. And other times it's like, like you said, like that, I mean, give me some tips. I mean, it's just, it's like, oh my God, do you know how much time and energy <laughs> that, you know, those of us who made this career have put into this <laughs> very important work and it's very powerful work and it takes a lot of experience, a lot of time. So yeah, I think like the ability to check in and see how a request makes you feel maybe. And then, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm just thinking of ways like, cause I'm thinking of myself maybe five years ago, like what would I have what did I need to hear? And I think it's that just like, does this, does it feel like something you want to be doing or does this feel like you're being used a little bit? And that, that doesn't feel good. That's an energy imbalance ultimately, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's okay to set boundaries, even though this is wellness, even though this is like helping children, you know, um, you can only give so much in this work. And if you're constantly giving, you know, you're not going to have enough for you and the people in your, you know, in your close circle. So I think it's, it's something that I took me a while to learn too. It's okay to set boundaries and people still hire me to consult them and mentor them and and help them teaching kids yoga. It wasn't like no one's going to hire me for this, but it's the people that are more dedicated. And, you know, we offer sliding scales and we find ways so that people can learn these tools where it doesn't break the bank, but it's, you know, it's reciprocated. Yes. Um, Yes. There was one other thing I just wanted to say in regards to when we were talking about the red flags and, you know, this is like, a dumb moment for me when I thought about this, but I just feel like it's worth sharing. And, you know, so often in any new job, it's always recommended to talk to the people already in the job or the people that have left the job. And so that's just like one other tip, like before you're working um, or contracting with really any organization, but kids yoga included, um, it's just like, talk to the people that work there. What do they think about them working there? How do they feel? Uh, talk to the people that left. Why did they leave? Because I think ultimately, if you want red flags, you can find out about them directly from the people that have worked in these companies. Yes, that's a really good tip. And also noticing like, is there a big turnaround? Are, are people leaving <laughs> often? Why? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. something I've noticed. <laughs> Um, I, I want it. So this is, I, I think this could be like a whole workshop seminar, this, this topic. Um, but I wanted to move on just for the sake of time. Was there anything else you wanted to, to add to this before we moved on? No, I think, I think those are like the important parts, you know, and yeah, if yeah. anyone else wants to ever reach out to me and have a conversation, like they're welcome to do that too. Yeah, um, great. it's a big topic, but yeah. It is. It is. You got the wheel spinning in my head. I'm like, there's so much, there's so much here. Um, But I guess this is kind of tied into it. So I've been asking people since the pandemic began, how they've been taking care of themselves. So for you personally, now this pandemic has, you know, we're, we're, we're coming up on a year almost since this Mm -hmm. started. So um, what have you been doing to take care of yourself during this time? So, you know, I've gotten that, you know, a few, that question in a few different ways, a few times over the pandemic, um, especially because it's in the wellness field, like I'm in the wellness field. Um, but in in some ways, like, I feel like I've been preparing for this pandemic my whole life. <laughs> like in, um, in 2012, I um, made a promise to myself to always try new things, even if they were uncomfortable. And so I like did things like improv and kickboxing, but I also did two um, 10 day silent retreats through Vipassana. And um, those are really uncomfortable. (laughs) 
And you learn really quickly how to like sit in discomfort and find a way to be okay in it. And so, you know, ultimately, I feel like I've been pretty lucky where um, I'm home a lot, you know, and I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Um, but some of the things that I've really been practicing during this time is um, my newly fiance, we recently got engaged. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we got a puppy almost a year ago and we did not get her because of the pandemic. It was a plan way in advance. <laughs> um, so we had a plan for this puppy. And so she's almost a year old now. And, you know, so she's been with us the entire pandemic. And it's been a lot of practice in presence, you know, in training her, in watching her grow, in cuddling her. And so between my puppy and my fiance, I've had a lot of presence. And in that presence, it allows me to feel a lot of joy. Like, I'm grateful that I can stay at home because I would be a hot, anxious mess if I had to be in public more, you know, and um, I'm just really grateful for the relationship that I have and just this amazing puppy. And so there's a lot of just being present, feeling that joy and that gratitude, and then, you know, just giving myself permission, you know, like people are like, do you lower your standards during a pandemic? And, and I think it's, you adjust your standards to the time and, you know, like life before a pandemic, I would have had a lot more things on my to-do list. And I would have had a lot more like, you need to complete these things. And I'm still being a functional adult. I'm still getting my stuff done, you know, but I'm lowering the bar. If I need to take a nap, if I'm feeling stressed, like I'm really just meeting myself day to day. And so that's really what's been showing up for me in the pandemic is just practicing presence, practicing gratitude, and then permission to go with the flow, whatever that flow might be. Yes. Oh, and that what kind of puppy do you have? <laughs> so she's a Bernadoodle. She's a oh. mini Bernadoodle. So she's like 35 pounds. Oh, they call so them cute. like bear Bernadoodle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I have a Rhodesian Ridgeback. So he's a big dog and he used to play with a full size <laughs> Bernadoodle. That's a, that was a big dog. Oh, <laughs> it's so they cute. They are big dogs. Yeah. Oh, and they're just so like goofy and yeah. funny. And, oh. Yeah. That's yeah, so nice to awesome. have during this time just to like, yeah, to have that energy around, that playful energy. Yeah. Um, and she loves play. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so cute. Well, uh, the, the last question I always ask is a kid's yoga gem. So for you, if there was one piece of advice that you would offer to those in the kids yoga industry, what would it be? Hmm. Hmm. One piece of advice. So can I put like two little nuggets together? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> um, I feel like the, the piece of advice is one is, is embody what you teach. You know, part of it is practicing what you teach, but really be your authentic self and, and let that shine through because kids learn by what you do and how you show up and less about what you say. Um, and then the other thing that kind of goes with that is be really clear on your intentions. What are your reasons for teaching kids yoga? Um, because I think these are such valuable life skills, you know, and so I show up with the intention of teaching life skills. Um, but I think really knowing your intentions can, one, support or harm teaching kids, but also support or harm the larger community that are teaching kids. So be clear on your intentions and be your authentic self. Love it. Love it. I, this has been an absolute pleasure. I, um, I want to have you back on and, and I'm just the wheels are spinning. So we'll see if there's something else we can do. Um, I'd love to work together within this community in this just topic more of like, of yes, the it's, it's like a combination of the business of kids yoga, but also finding your value and taking your value. These are all themes I've been hearing a lot. So yeah. just thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for being on and for offering all your wisdom. Thank you. It has been such an honor and joy to be on this podcast. Um, and I also just wanted to say a uh, happy anniversary. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It takes a lot of work to do this and maintain the momentum and motivation. I'm sure during a pandemic, yes. when you also have kids. Like, yes. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it hasn't been easy, but I'm so proud that, yeah, coming up on, you know, over 50 episodes. So, but it's people like you, like every conversation I have has been, has invigorated me. So, so yes. Thank you. Thank you to everyone listening. And thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> all right. We'll talk soon and take care. Yeah. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. If you enjoyed the episode and you haven't already, I would really appreciate if you can leave a rating and review and also subscribe to the podcast. This helps people find the podcast and direct more people towards it so we can spread kids yoga to more children. You can also follow us at the Kids Yoga Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And you can always send me an email at thekidsyogapodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your feedback, your questions, and any ideas you have for future episodes. So thank you so much for being here and for listening, and I hope to see you next week.